This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. Apologies. Um, it is my proud privilege and really makes me so happy to be here today on this stage to congratulate the Vleen, who has been like family to me for now I don't know how many years, I think just millions of years. This book of hers, Political and Incorrect, is a compilation of her articles which in a way shows us how India changed and then how it didn't. So she has chronicled the shift from centralized planning and the public sector to decentralized uh, planning and then also partnerships. She's actually put before her readers what the state of affairs was, where it went wrong, and what the goal should have been. And on the occasion of this release of your book, Political and Incorrect, Congratulations, many, many congratulations. Just keep writing for us. Let's keep enjoying that column of yours. I think all of us are here today and delighted with Tavleen's book. Like me, I'm sure most of you have known Tavleen for many, many years. She's always, as Arun Puri said, been extremely straightforward. I'm happy that she's put together this book, which is so much of her writing over the decades. And I'm sure all of us are going to look for, are looking forward to reading it. I'm not going to make a speech. I'd like you to buy the book, <laughs> basically. I think it's worth buying. It really tells the story, as I saw it, in a very opinionated and... Uh, difficult, sometimes aggressive way <laughs> over the past 20 years. So please enjoy yourselves. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Vasu and Naveen, for your wonderful speech. Thank you, Shekhar, for praising me more than you ever have in all the years I've known you. Thank you, Arun. And thank you, all of you, for coming. And please enjoy the rest of the evening and buy the book. Well, political and incorrect. Now, I can tell you very few subjects get to be more political and incorrect than this particular one, which is Radical Islam and Hindutva, can they be equated? And I think now we can all speak rather bluntly about it, seeing as the elections in Gujarat are over. So Salman, you in particular don't necessarily have to mince any words um, uh, at this particular point. It's not going to be losing you any votes. Would you like to have a first crack, Salman? Um, can they be equated? Well, I, I, I think undoubtedly uh, uh, there are uh, ex two, two extremes of, of uh, two wonderful religions, um, each of which have uh, fantastic ability uh, to reach out to people of uh, different opinions and different attitudes. Let me just say this, that, uh, that Islam, uh, much of radical Islam is not uh, uh, something that you find in India, but you find elsewhere in the world. And much of Islam is fighting against itself. Uh, much of radical Islam is questioning Islamic uh, institutions and Islamic societies and uh, questioning uh, uh, such reform and change and, and uh, attitudes as, as you see in the establishment. Um, Hindutva is a lot to do with somebody else. Uh, I don't see Hindutva attacking Hindus. Hindus attack uh, non-Hindus. Uh, radical Islam began attacking Islam. It's just that somebody else, when it interfered with radical Islam, or one way or the other joined hands, um, that uh, they came under attack from radical Islam. And I think that's the big difference asking uh, basically what is fundamentalism, the word which has not been used, but which is the elephant in the room, kind of. Right? And I would then argue that uh, fundamentalism is the response of a religious tradition to a perceived loss of power in the public square. 
and it should be distinguished from orthodoxy, which is the response of a religious tradition to the perceived loss of piety in the public square. Now, I would grant that orthodoxy could be inscribed with political meaning. That's possible. But I think it is analytically important to distinguish between the two. Right. So the question to ask is, what is making Hinduism feel disempowered in the public square? And what is making Islam feel disempowered in the public square? Well, I would like to, uh, with some reservations, uh, support uh, Dr. Sharma's views. And uh, without trying to waste the time of the panel and also of the audience, raise a question as to what do we understand by radical Islam? It, is, it appears to me that the definition of radical Islam is somehow accepted as given. I believe that each one of us has his own perception of what it, radical Islam means. It could mean al-Qaeda. It could mean uh, uh, Abu Mus'hab al-Zarqawi in Iraq, who was one even more extreme than Osama bin Laden. It could also mean people in Kashmir. I think uh, because the subject we're discussing is politically incorrect, I think we should not hesitate in terms of identifying at least the areas and problems which have led us to this discussion. But each one of us has a very vague understanding of what radical Islam is in the light of post uh, um, uh, the Twin Tower, demolition of the Twin Towers. In India, one has faced problems in Kashmir, one has faced problems elsewhere of people who have taken the law into their own hands. Having said that, I would agree that there is a huge difference between fundamentalism on the one hand, which is based on orthodoxy, and radicalism, which claims to be uh, a, a reversion to the earlier tenets of Islam or the attempt to reestablish them, but which is, in essence, an echo of the encounter of religion, be it Hindu or Muslim, with modernity and modern institutions, such pro the problematic that arises out of it. The problematic arises out of it because the structures of modern society are such that they cannot easily be assimilated into the frameworks of religious thought without a great deal of it. One more point, and I shall finish, uh, and that is that in, to make a positive statement, I think in some ways there are extraordinary similarities between radical Islam and Hinduism. Not everything, but remarkable similarities. Thank you. Mr. Aaron Shuri, um, so far I would venture to say we've still been fairly politically correct for most part. Sir, I, the answer is yes and no. In the sense that all traditions have the potential for extremism. And if, a, for instance, uh, there are traditions which are exclusivist and aggressive. And normally speaking, we associate them with the traditions originating in Palestine and in Saudi Arabia. Now, but, and the Indic religion traditions have generally been all embracing and inclusive. But the important point to remember is that everybody has that potential of extremism. So that, uh, don't start by equating them, but fear the potential for extremism in every tradition. So that if the state is um, inequitous, if the state is uh, pandering to one group or the other, if discourse is uneven, and I can give you 100 examples of that from everyday journalism in India, then please be assured that Hinduism will also acquire what Swami Vivekananda said it should acquire, that is, an Islamic body. Second thing is, the answer is no because the, the fundamentals of these two traditions, not just Islam and Hinduism, but those three traditions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam on the one side, and Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism here, they are different. And those fundamentals really are about, in one view, reality is simple, 
as in uh, Islam, in Christianity, in Judaism. It has been revealed to one person. He has put it in one book. That book is difficult to understand. You require an intermediary, the church, the state, uh, the party, the ulema, to interpret it for you. And your piety is determined by your adherence to the uh, prescriptions of that intermediary or the dictates and provisions of that particular book. In the Indic traditions, it, on every matter, it is the opposite. Reality is complex, it is multi-layered, um, it has not been revealed to one person. But, and the test is not whether you, uh, uh, you adhere to what that person said or that book says, but on your own experience and your seeing it. That is the test. Therefore, reform from within the tradition is, and the Catholicity and plurality is built into the Indic traditions. It is excluded in other traditions. That is the uh, way. Therefore, you cannot pin down people to uh, an extremism and say, this is the only tradition. So there is a vast difference, and political correctness always keeps us saying the essential unity of all religions and so on. Well, my own experience with teaching world religions and studying them has been that all religious traditions contain strands which are generous and those which are not, which are radiant and less radiant. Tolerant and less tolerant. And less tolerant. And so a lot depends on the historical circumstances in which the traditions find themselves. So you're saying that there are times, according to you, there's nothing inherent in the religion. There are times when Hinduism could be more tolerant, less tolerant. Times when Islam would be more tolerant, less tolerant, more inclusive, less inclusive. That's, that's essentially what you're saying, Mr. Salman? Well, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I think that uh, I, I agree with Raja Saab that we've shifted to uh, looking at which religion offers what and why. Uh, are they more uh, uh, inclusive? Are they not more inclusive? Are they rigid? Are they tolerant? Are they flexible? That's not the issue. If, if this thesis is correct, if Hinduism is more tolerant, if Hinduism is more flexible, because it hasn't been a reveal, it's not a reveal uh, religion, it hasn't come to one person, it doesn't uh, require an intermediary, etc., etc., to be interpreted, then why do we have Hindutva? It shouldn't have happened. Why was Gandhi killed? Gandhi was killed in the land in which they, we, uh, we are supposed to be tolerant, but he was killed. And Gandhi was not killed by a Muslim radical. He was killed by a man who felt that he was upholding Hindutva, Hindu, Hindu, Hindu dharma. On the other hand, you have Islam, and you have a, you have a celebrated poet of Islam saying, saying, Sakhi sharab pine de masjid mein baith kar, warna wo jagah bata de jahan khuda na ho. Now, that's also part of Islam. The fact that there is somebody in Islam today who picks up the gun, and there can be a hundred reasons why he would have picked up the gun, don't equate that necessarily with an inherent tendency of Islam to be radical. And certainly, simply because Hinduism is not a revealed book, don't assume that there isn't a possibility in Hinduism of extremism, and that I think Arun has agreed. The test would be, precisely of the historical situation in which each religion today finds itself, and therefore how it is beginning to respond. And if people are frightened about Hindutva and want to put it down and they see some demons there, then see the causes which are encouraging that kind of an interpretation or that appropriation of a particular point of view and deal with those causes now. Maybe we should deal with the causes with Islam also in the same way. But those are the causes. First premise has to be an absolutely fair and an absolutely firm state. And an absolutely even-handed discourse. If you depart on these two points, please be assured that either Islam will become radical or Hinduism will become radical, and there will be enough text for anyone to in Google.